I love that Timothy text. Um, it just is really beautiful and it's tucked in there. And I'll be honest, I don't remember reading that text before, but I certainly have heard it. That time to pause and think about the importance of the church praying for leaders in high positions. You see, scripture doesn't separate church and state. Scripture says we are to care for and to pray for everyone. And you're so great in praying for others, not only naming the congregation members, but naming other neighboring churches in the synod and, um, and your companion synod. And I love the part of scripture that says, you know, when we don't know what to pray for, or when we don't have good words, you know, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, which happens here every time I come because I usually stumble over some name, especially some of those church names. So I kind of wanted to just spend the whole sermon on that Timothy text. Don't you think that would be nice? And we could just kind of skip over that whole messy gospel for today. Um, Somebody's catching my joke there. Yeah, because like, who really wants to talk about that? Um, I, I don't really, oh. But I remembered when I read the story that there was more to it, that the harshness um, that I hear and the confusion I experience when I read through, that there's, there's more to the text. And where would I figure that out? Well, of course, seminary. Um, preaching text to help me to see scripture a little differently. So we're going to set that aside, though, because I'm going to ask you to do one quick thing with me. I'm going to ask you, invite you to look around this room, which means you can turn around, okay? Look all the way around the room. You can look at people as long as you smile. Um, no tongue sticking out. Look around the room. And I want you to fix your eyes and then point to something in this room or someone in this room that is a symbol or a sign of faith to you. So look around and then point, yes, I'm telling you to point, at someone or something that is a sign of God to you. And the people up front really have to do this because we can all see them. them can, they can kind of get away with it, but point, point to something. Yes, yes. Oh man, they're so uncomfortable up here, aren't they? Okay, all at the same time, point to something that is a symbol of faith to you. He's closest, so he's behaving. Okay, I've got two of them, behave, three behaving up here. Okay, thank you. It would be a delight to go around and hear everyone share about the symbol and how that shares about your faith. And all of a sudden, we would have a greater understanding of faith than what we did when we walked in. It's a bigger perspective. See, you're in the same space, rubbing shoulders, some of you with others that you've rubbed shoulders with for a very long time, but we have a different perspective. So now I'm gonna invite you to come back to the gospel and be willing to hear a few different things about the gospel that maybe you hadn't thought of or heard before. How many people have heard this scripture passage before this gospel? And whoever laughed, I don't know who that was, did you laugh for good reason? Like you've heard this one or you, listen, you actually listened when it was read and was like, oh my gosh. Um, I'm gonna invite you. So there's this story, we call it the dishonest manager. Well really dishonest only mentions that at the beginning and we don't really know what he may or may not be dishonest about. We don't know that. He's accused of doing something, but we're not told what he's accused of. But at least any time I've read this previously, I automatically assumed he was guilty. Wow. 
Um, you've never, oh, see, you're better than I am. I always assumed this manager was guilty of whatever he was accused of. That's horrible. I mean, one of the biggest values we have here in the U.S. is not assuming that someone's guilty until they've been proven so. And actually, guess what? It doesn't even say at the end that he truly was guilty. Did anybody else automatically assume this manager was guilty? Thank you for your honesty and your back row and a few other people. Yeah. A few other things to know about this story. The word squander can be translated um, a couple of different ways or shrewdly. The word shrewdly can be translated as wisely or prudently. So this master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted prudently. Hmm. For the children of this age are more prudent in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. Shrewdly just sounds icky to me. Negative, um, you, you put dishonest and you put shrewd and that he's been accused of something and, and I had already categorized him. But if you switch it, knowing that you can translate this as um, shrewd or wise or prudent, especially prudent or wise, I hear it differently. We don't know really the whole situation. Maybe it's not just the manager who's a little dishonest. Maybe it's the owner who's also a little dishonest. So maybe the dishonesty isn't when he invites somebody to cut their bill. Maybe that's the first time he's speaking with some kind of heart or care. Maybe that's when he's finally being wise and treating people with respect. I've learned an awful lot about grace from my husband, who's an attorney. And especially about how grace works in our legal system. Now, a lot of people wouldn't think of grace in a legal system, right? We usually think of people who get what they deserve, right? And there's been a lot of talk about that. But a couple of examples where he has shared with me about grace and his ability to look at those who have been wronged or those who have been injured by someone's actions and the person for whom did something and the court system. There's kind of three different people who are in conversation at that time. And he has the ability to look and see what's going on and how to make those decisions. Well, in the county where he was judge in Iowa, um, the typical um, overdrawn check was to Walmart, the gas station, and the grocery store. You're putting it together, right? Yeah, someone who just didn't really have enough funds to pay for those things that were needed. So what he would do is if someone came to court, and of course a business needed to be made whole. So if they came to court and could pay for whatever item or items they purchased, plus the cost of that business, you know, that over and check and, and could pay to, to make that business whole, and then the minimum amount for the court costs. That's all he'd ask. Now he could do more, right? So he could force them to pay the maximum amount by the letter of the law, which usually would mean, or in addition, he could send them to jail, which at that time was like $60 a day for the county to pay for plus other expenses. Plus, they couldn't work a job. 
Plus, then they couldn't pay the bill. It's kind of a beautiful story about grace, right? Or car seats. They didn't have a car seat. If they came into court and they actually had a car seat, then he let go of the fine. Recently, he had somebody come to court and appear in front of him who owed some money and the person had part of it and said, you know, I've got this much and I'd like to pay it, but I, you know, I'm, and I'm intending to pay this much today. And in the course of conversation, he, this person also shared um, about needing to pay some child support. And my husband said, I wasn't there, but I heard, the, heard about this. My husband said, um, wait a minute, we, we can come up with a payment plan because I want to make sure you take care of your child support bill. Now, this isn't a guy pulling his leg, you know. Judges have some insight about information that we don't always have. That's a whole lot more grace than I gave this manager in the scripture for whom it didn't say he had necessarily done something. And then the question is, really, is it about finding who did the wrong thing in the scripture text anyway? So I also want to share with you what's sitting between, or what, sit, what is sitting around the scripture text. So we're hearing this story about the manager. The other um, scripture stories are the prodigal son, which some may also call the radical son, and the radical father who welcomed him back. And then on the other side of this scripture text is a story of a rich man. Now, the rich men in this time period, you could see it because their homes were wealthy and oftentimes there was a front gate. And at the front gate of this rich man's home was a poor man who had sores all over his body for whom the dogs would lick his source, which also means he was probably so depleted of energy he couldn't really make them go away. And this poor man talks about, if I could just have the food for whom um, the dogs get to eat, the food the dogs get to eat. Oh, can you kind of hear that? The dogs get more than this man and the dogs are licking his... Oh. So the rich man and the poor man die in the same day. The poor man's name happens to be Lazarus, which we don't hear this story of Lazarus. We usually hear the story of Lazarus coming out of the tomb. It's different than this one. This story is Lazarus dies the same day the rich man. Lazarus goes up to heaven and is sitting next to Abraham. The rich man goes to Hades. So this story we hear today is between those two stories, the rich man and the poor man, who both die on the same day, and the prodigal son. Luke, all over the place, turns things upside down. The youngest wasn't even supposed to get any inheritance at all. He squanders it, and then he gets welcomed back. We kind of like the story of the poor man getting getting to go to heaven and the rich man not until I remind, that, remind you that you are, because you're part of America, you are some of the richest people in the world. It doesn't always feel like that, but you are. Maybe I'm just uncomfortable with that story now. Luke turns things upside down all the time. So let's look at the story of the manager as turning things upside down. Let's look at it as that manager saying, wait a minute. I have this ability to change the way I serve as manager and to work to change my relationship. So Jesus is saying, look, you, mm, should we say, look, you Christians. 
There are people out there in the world who are more wise and prudent and um, thoughtful and deliberate about how they treat one another, how they build relationships, how they take something that's terrible, a terrible situation. The manager could have just walked away and said, you know what, I'm, whatever I say, I'm probably still gonna be in trouble. He's told me I'm not gonna have a job. He could have just walked away, but instead he used his creativity. He used his ability to see, well, this is a situation. What can I do in this situation? to try to bring about something good for those who owed money and to build relationships. I know that sounds like a stretch, but that's not just coming from me. I, pulled, I shared that from some of the wiser people than me, is that Jesus was pointing to, look, they are using wisdom and creativity to say, how can we do something different here in order to build relationships and do good for others? It's a different way of looking at the scripture. It's a different way of seeing how we can take this scripture and say, ah, the manager turned the situation upside down. What can we do to turn the situation upside down? And it never says that he loses his job. Jesus ends before we really know what happens to him It never says what happens moving forward. Like I said, maybe the rich man, maybe the owner, was also not always very honest, and maybe it changed how he treated the people that he worked with. I don't know. And obviously that wasn't as important as pointing out that he did something different. And of course, of course, it comes to those last words You can't worship God and wealth. There's still a lot of this scripture that makes me a bit uneasy. And if you think that I tied it all up with a bow, then you'll have to show me where the bow is because I didn't come with the tied all up with the bow. But I wanted you to think about and know that there are different ways of seeing things. There are ways that we can look at things differently, both to see our own built-in bias, mine was he was automatically guilty, and, God, what is Jesus telling us? What is he encouraging? What is he stretching us to think about? Doing things differently than maybe we have before? looking at others, not just, well, they're not Christians, so they don't know, but what can we learn from everyone around us? And how can we be more intentional, more wise and prudent, or shrewd, although that still sounds a little negative, more wise and prudent with what God gives us and what life gives us? Amen.